All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Trevor Smith. I'm producer for NPR's Jazz Night in America and WBGO Studios. I'm here with singer, songwriter, all around incredible artist, Amos Lee. Amos, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you for that intro. It's extremely generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for, for coming on and joining us at BGO. Um, so you have a new record coming out this week, November 18th, on Dual Tone Records called My Ideal, a tribute to Chet Baker Sings. And this is an interpretation of a very special album to a lot of people, but particularly to you, uh, this iconic Chet Baker Sings record. So tell me, like, how did you discover this album? How did it become nestled into your psyche and heart and, and sort of musical uh, world? So 2020, it's April 2020. We were all, I mean, most of us were not doing very well. Uh, two of my favorite musicians, the, the two of the biggest inspirations I had, which are John Prine and Bill Withers, both died within like three weeks of each other. And I was super devastated. Um, wasn't really able to listen to any music for a minute. And uh, I remember listening to, um, there was a band in Philly years ago that did standards called um, The Gentleman Four. And they used to do a version of My Ideal. And I always, I just fell in love with that tune. I didn't grow up really listening to a lot of jazz. The only time I would, he I heard jazz, I mean, I'm, and I don't know if your listeners, I'm putting quotes around it. It's not really quote, quote jazz, but it depends on what you think of Frank Sinatra is jazz or not. I think some things he does, like what, he, let me just say, point blank, do you think Frank Sinatra is a jazz singer? Oh yeah, I okay. mean, I, cool. I think, yeah, because he's, he's interpreting the, or he interpreted the Great American Songbook, which yeah. is sort of, you know, the pulse for all Cool, that. cool. I, I, I always thought of him more as a pop singer, like, because it was so iconic, and I think of a jazz singer more of like a nuanced did jazz i don't know so anyway this is a, a deeper conversation but i grew up listening to frank sinatra but only at the doctor's office because <laughs> I, I was living in south philly and when you went into the doctor's office dr oriente he always had sinatra on and he had like the poker dogs with smoking cigars on the walls and it was old ladies on leather couches it was a whole scene out of a scorsese film or something but um that was the only time I had heard those songs before. So when I heard this group, I was like, oh God, that song is incredible. It's so beautiful. And I just went and tried to find that tune and then tried to find this other song that I came across called Everything Happens to Me, which is not on Chet Sings. But I was started listening to Chet Sings over and over and over and over and over again. And the songs and the performances just resonated for me in a place that was deeply sad but also kind of there was a nonchalance about it that made a lot of sense to me and was comforting to me like you can feel terrible and it's still okay and like there's a there's a sort of like chill way to feel devastated <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's a perfect pull quote for a sticker on the the reissue of chet baker yeah. sings <laughs> yeah um yeah, I mean, this this record, Chet, Chet Baker Sings, the record, is a collection of songs that have just been reinterpreted almost ad nauseum. You know, Sinatra covered a lot of these songs. Musicians are still covering these songs. But in tackling this album and, and that sort of songbook, um, did you have Chet Baker's, you know, signature, silky voice? hanging over your shoulder when you're doing this or like how you know you guys have very different voices you know how did digesting this album change your approach when reinterpreting it it was amazing um it it was a an absolute like game changer for me um i'd listened to him sing before but he has this way um of just kind of doing things that are impossible in a way that seems in, entirely easy and care, carefree. Um, and I know that that's the entire charm of him, but when you get below, below the surface, 
I mean, the songs are the songs. They're great songs. They're standards. Everyone blows on these. Everyone knows these. They're all the same. Hmm. Like, they're great. Undeniably great songs. The way that Chet approaches them on this record and the band, um, you know, getting underneath, and I'll just say this because it's a weird metaphor, but getting under the sheets with them hmm. is a different experience because the way that he sings the tone is incredible the pitch is incredible the way that he breathes is sort of like inhuman in a lot of ways like i don't know how he's holding and getting to those notes like i don't know how he's like it doesn't seem like he's breathing at all like i'm i'm like I had to study breath to do these these songs. I had to study my own breath. I had to figure out where, like, all right. So the band laid these tunes down. They did them in a studio. Incredible. They did 16 tunes multiple times in one day. Anwar Marshall, David Strime, uh, Madison Rast. That's the band on the record. They absolutely crushed and played these songs so beautifully. Um, and I, I had to spend time with them because I, w I was like, oh, I'll just go and sing over them. And I know these tunes. I'll do it. And I was like, nope, that is not how this is going to work. And I really had to study how to find the way to serve the songs and serve a tribute to this record. And not even as much through the, like, the acrobatic side of singing, which, you know, as a pop singer, you're kind of used to fielding that way. This is a, a much more kind of, I don't, I want to use the word elegant, but it's just a much different experience. Like the way that he does endings, they seem easy, but the notes are held in such a way, in such a quiet way, in such a gentle way, perfectly, like you can't, and there's no vibrato. He's not going, my ideal. You know, he's going, my ideal. And it's just a tif totally different way to approach singing than I had ever done. And it made me re-examine my own style and my own approach to songs and singing and i and i'm grateful for it so long answer i could probably talk for like an hour and a half more on it but well i i guess that's what you get when you're a trumpet player first is you have that insane breath control um so so you mentioned the band uh they're philly cats right Yes, they are all Philly cats. I think Anwar lives in New York now. I know he was playing with Joey D, rest in peace. But um, but I think yeah, I think Madison is a, a New York in New York. But I think they're all they're all Philly people. David is definitely a Philly cat. Yeah. So you know, having the band track uh, ahead of you, that's that's a that's a challenge. You know, because when when like back when Chet was recording these records. It was like a few mics in one room, like eight hours and you're out sort of thing. Like how did, how did that sort of add that extra layer of, 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 of challenge in sort of getting to what Chet was trying to, trying to do on the record? Like were, were you in your own head a little bit more or second guessing your performance or like was it a little more sort of peaceful and you know uh because you sort of had been digesting this album in solitude so i digested the album as a listener for a very long time before i even tried to sing these songs mm -hmm. and for your listeners who i imagine are devoted and deep lovers of jazz music I am definitely not a jazz musician in any way. I'm just telling y'all right now, I've never, I've taken two guitar lessons in my life. I've never taken any singing lessons. I have no musical education at all. Sorry. But the education that I'm getting is just through listening and through feeling. And I think that when it comes to jazz, the beauty of so much of it is that it is such a tradition in America. And it is such a kind of like word of mouth almost like 
you can learn the songs through feeling them and experiencing them, although you have to cut your teeth a lot. And I had to cut my teeth a lot on these tunes. So when those guys who are jazz musicians have all gone to school, have played these songs a bunch of times, are already incredible, um, I didn't want to get in their way, and I knew that I would. I think I would have been able to sing the tunes, but I don't think I would have been able to sing them in the way I really wanted to to serve the project properly. And um, so it was all love from my end. I sat with the songs, I sang them, I re-sang them. The hard part with this stuff too, especially with Chet, is like he has such an idiosyncratic approach as a singer, which is good, but also like you want to imitate him to an extent, but then when you try to imitate him, it's like, it just sounds bad. And so the, the sort of like the thin line for me was how do I pay tribute to this in a way that feels honest and real to me and express the love that I have for this project without imitating. And so it took me a really long time of finding those little spots to like deviate and to also celebrate the way that he sang um, in a way that felt like a tribute, but not a, a, a copy or a, a facsimile. Yeah. And, and you did a, a, such a beautiful job. You know, I, I got to listen to the album uh, up and down a few times and it's just absolutely gorgeous and it doesn't sound like you're you know trying to be chet this is your own beautiful interpretation of it and uh, i'm here with amos lee who on november 18th is releasing my ideal a tribute to chet baker sings on dual tone records uh, again i'm trevor smith producer for jazz night in america and wbgo studios um so so amos um you mentioned that you're not a jazz musician, but you are definitely sort of part of this 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 canon as a vocalist. You were also on the Blue Note Records label, and so you're you're etched in jazz history, whether you, hey, you, you like it or not. I'm happy to be there. So the first the first job in music that I ever had was working at a record shop in Columbia, South Carolina, called Papa Jazz Record Shop. Nice. I am not I am not taking any advertising dollars from this, but if you do ever want like vintage jazz records, like vinyl, original pressings of blue notes, Papa Jazz is like the greatest shop. It's incredible. They've just they they, they changed my life as a listener because every day I went into work there was a different jazz record. I learned who Eric Dolphy was. I listened to Coltrane at the Vanguard for the first time working there. We would put Monk on. We would put like Sam Rivers on. We would put, because Chris Potter is from Columbia, South Carolina, we'd put Chris Potter on. Um, it was just an incredible education for me. And it, it helped me learn something I would have never had the kind of like depth to experience had I not been listening to jazz records eight hours a day for two years, which is what I did. So as a listener, I'm pretty experienced. Um, so when Blue Note approached me in 2003 or four, I was already in awe of them, not because of Nora, who, although I loved Nora and I love Nora and I think she's incredible, it wasn't because of her because she was on Blue Note first. The, you know, the legendary Bruce Lundvall signed her. I know, I'm sure you know who Bruce was. Bruce rang, ran Blue Note forever, an incredible, um, jazz music champion and um so when they approached me i was like well i i already am in because those records changed my life as a listener and as a person who loves music like there was nothing to me more sacred than like a blue note record from the 60s that was all i wanted to listen to it was the gold standard and to be affiliated with that label was an incredible honor to me. And also, by the way, I'm very honored to be on this show. Thank you very much. Like, it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so great to have you. And you you mentioned that you listen to records, you know, at work eight hours a day, and it just it sort of changes your DNA, you know, um, and and sort of dialing back to talking about interpretation of, of various songs and Frank Sinatra. Uh, one of the toughest 
uh, Mountains to Climb for vocalists in jazz is the tune My Funny Valentine. Mm. Not not just because of the the range that you need, but also like Sinatra's version, Ella Fitzgerald's version, and Chet Baker's version. Like y- you can't top that. But you knocked it out of the park. Um, it's it's absolutely amazing, and we'll we'll play a little bit uh, of that in, in post. But I, it does have a, a little parenthetical after. Uh, the song name of My Funny Valentine. Could you tell the the listeners who Oscar and Eli are? Sure. So I think that there are definitely some purists out there who are going to be like, what are you doing? Do not touch, do not touch anything about this song. And that's fair. I accept your criticism. That's okay. I'm fine with feeling like what I want to do is what I want to do. Um, so first off, thank you very much for that compliment. It's, it's such a beautiful song and um i have to give a lot of credit to david strime the piano player on the project for his really beautiful rendition it's it, there's almost like an impressionism that's dancing around beneath the chords um and he he really laid a beautiful bed for me to to hover over um so oscar and ellie are are um are a couple um that are in a a Danish film. I don't know if it's a horror film or not, called Let the Right One In. It's a love story. It's one of the most beautiful love stories that I've ever um, watched or experienced as a a viewer. Um, Just a deeply touching film about some very dark stuff, which is, you know, my very much my brand. But um, there, I wanted to pay tribute to that kind of love, the kind of love that, that may not be normal or may feel out of the box or may not be beautiful to other people, but is beautiful to you. And um, when I was singing the song, I was thinking about them and that kind of love and um, what we sacrifice for each other, how we support each other in ways that feels feels real. Um, and I'm not, not saying that in this film, there's like some horrible stuff that happens, but um, I also just thought, I understood what the what the film was trying to convey and I thought it was really beautiful and I wanted to pay tribute to it in my own way. Very cool. So Papa Jazz Records and this yeah. film are Amos Lee's picks uh, today on WBGO. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 100%. Uh, so I I read somewhere that that Chet when he was Chet Baker was in community college, he was discouraged by a teacher to pursue a career in music. And obviously he defied their opinion uh but the the role of the teacher is is really important and and you were a a classroom teacher is that right yes uh, i taught second grade in north philadelphia um i'm not sure if i actually taught anything i think i did um i definitely enjoyed the kids they were hilarious and amazing and and beautiful and and the situation was very intense Um, you learned a lot about the kids and their, and what they, what their daily life is. And, you know, you learn, you learn about things like, and this is a long time ago, but still you learn about the digital divide and you learn about what so many children have to overcome just to get to the baseline. And, uh, it's a, it's a huge shout out to teachers and parents who support children in their learning. Um, it's a huge shout out to the kids for being as perseverant and as um, passionate about learning as they are. So that's a, an incredible um, experience that I had, but it was also like very eye opening. Awesome. And, and are, are you planning on uh, reviving tickets for teachers? Uh, and future tours? I would or? love to. I would love to do more, frankly. I mean, it, it's there's so much that teachers are up against. And, you know, with all of the latest information coming out about, like, you know, oh, well, the, the COVID era was terrible for schools and terrible for students. And I understand it, it was a, just a devastating time for everyone. Um, teachers also have to now make up all of this all of this time that was spent sort of half in half life for everyone and uh you know they're 
they're they're up against a lot to teach to the test to reach the kids to reach the parents to navigate all of the modern um deviations that we're we're bringing to our to our schools and what what how we can most serve these students both from a, an educational standpoint and a social standpoint and a cultural standpoint mm -hmm. building huge bridges across like large parts of the of the society that that we have to find borders, you know, we have to find borders that we can exist in from an educational standpoint, but also understand the unique position that each each student is facing. And that is a really difficult thing in a country as diverse and and huge as the United States of America. I mean, I taught kids who were from Spanish speaking foster homes who were Spanish speaking. And like, how are you going to hold this child to the same level of accountability as a learner who is bilingual by the way hmm. but also like reading skills are going to absolutely be behind because he doesn't have a mom and dad reading english to him or a mom and a mom or a dad and a dad at home reading english to them every night you know whatever it might be like we need to it's a really dynamic challenge to to, to standardize a nation that doesn't have a, a standardizable outcome. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, my, my wife it works for the New York City Department of Education and there's just, there, there are mountains uh, ahead of us, but um, we're, I, I, have, I have faith that we'll, we'll all get there with, with um, passionate teachers and incredible music like uh, your your new record coming out November 18th, My Ideal, a tribute to Chet Baker Sings. Uh, Amos Lee, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been really fun hanging with you. Today. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. And keep jazz living, brother. Amen.